Hi there, this is Richard Hatchett, a London-based nurse tutor, and I taught 12-lead ECG or EKG interpretation in the clinical and university settings for about 20 years. Right, you've clicked on this clip because you want to know my six steps to 12-lead ECG or EKG interpretation. A couple of things before we start. Remember to keep practicing and reading around ECG interpretation so that you can bring more to each of the steps I'm going to show you. Importantly, you need to work systematically when you review a 12 lead. Even in practice, if you're pushed for time or if colleagues are just pointing things out on a 12 lead, as they often do, do work systematically. This reduces the risk that you're going to miss something, particularly if there are subtle changes. And you want to give the best to your patients, so make sure you review systematically. Now the steps I'm going to show you should encompass most of those you see in other resources, but they will vary. But basically, these are the steps that you follow. Step 1. Ensure that you have a clean trace. On your 12 lead, if there are any thickened lines, wavy lines, interference, etc., this should be sorted at the point of recording, and make sure the ECG has been recorded accurately. If in any doubt and you're able to, re-record, but sort these issues at the point of recording. Step 2. Check the calibration. You have two calibrations, the height calibration and the speed calibration. On the height calibration, look at the left of the 12 lead ECG or EKG and you'll see a little box. This must equate to two large squares high. It doesn't have to exactly lie over the two large squares, but it must be equal to two large squares high. This is because the leads are sensing electrical activity, and when they sense one millivolt, the stylus will move up two large squares, so it must be calibrated correctly. The machine should do this, but just check it when you look at the recording. This is important because some conditions rely critically on that calibration being accurate. An example would be left ventricular hypertrophy, where the left ventricle has enlarged. Although it doesn't always show on the 12 lead ECG, when it does, you'll see tall or heightened R waves over the left ventricle. And you have to assure yourself that you are actually seeing that, that is, that the calibration has been set correctly. The other calibration is the speed setting. You need to see 25 millimeters per second printed on the recording, and this is an international setting. Critically important again, because all your measurements need to be accurate. If the setting is too fast, it will stretch out the complexes. If it's too slow, everything will be bunched up together. The graph paper indicates time. Therefore, measurements such as the PR interval, measured from the beginning of the P wave to the end of the flat line that follows it, the width of the QRS complex, which at its widest point must be on or less than three small squares, and the heart rate all need to be assessed accurately, and they won't be if the speed setting is incorrect. Step 3. Is the patient in sinus rhythm? If they're in sinus rhythm in one lead, they'll be in sinus rhythm in all leads. You can't have a mixture of different arrhythmias in different leads, because the ECG is recorded at the same time point, it's just the electrical activity is looked at from 12 different angles. Take a look at the rhythm strip that's printed along the bottom of the recording, because this will give you the most complexes. The leads above only give you a few complexes to work with. If there is no rhythm strip, and sometimes there isn't, look at lead 2. The rhythm strip is normally lead 2, and this is because it's a very upright lead. You get a nice tall R wave. Therefore, if the patient is in sinus rhythm, it will appear more familiar to you because it will match more of what you see in a textbook. Now, if you're uncertain if they're in sinus rhythm, look at a few more leads. If you're absolutely clear they're not in sinus rhythm, that's where your skill comes in and you've got to work out what the arrhythmia is, based on your ECG knowledge and obviously the presenting patient in front of you. Obviously it's beyond the scope of this clip to go through every possible arrhythmia that it could be, so do keep practicing. Step 4. Is there one P wave per QRS complex? If there are more P waves than QRS complexes, this could indicate second or third degree heart block. 
Now second degree heart block or atrioventricular block has a couple of types and third degree heart block is where there is a complete cessation of electrical activity moving from atria to ventricle and to keep the heart pumping the ventricles release their own usually slow ventricular ectopic or extrasystole. So you need to delve into this more closely. It's giving you a warning sign just in your initial review. More P waves and QRS complexes could indicate second or third degree heart block. Step five, consider measurements. Now we've touched on this a little already, so we're kind of halfway there. But there are three measurements I'd like you to consider. Others will recommend more and that's fine because you need to build on your ECG knowledge. But look at the PR interval. As said, it's measured from the beginning of the P wave to the end of the flat line which follows it. This should be three to five small squares, no longer. If persistently and consistently longer, this could indicate first degree heart block, where depolarization is being held up a little too long in the atrioventricular or AV node. Look at the QRS complex. At its widest point, this should be on or less than three small squares. Look also at the shape of the QRS complex. Is this bizarre or odd in shape? If you have a widened and bizarre shaped QRS complex, this could indicate a conduction abnormality within the ventricles themselves. For example, there could be a conduction blockage within the bundle branches, such as left or right bundle branch block or bifascicular block or it could mean that depolarization is originating from within the ventricular wall itself, such as with ventricular tachycardia or VT, or a ventricular ectopic or extrasystole. Consider then the heart rate. There are various ways of doing this. What I would recommend, if the heart rate is regular, is counting the number of large squares between one R wave and the next R wave, what we call the R to R interval. Divide this number into 300. So, for example, if the heart rate is quite high and you have two large squares between one R wave and the next, 300 divided by 2 is 150. Three large squares, 300 divided by 3, is 100, and so on. If you only have part of a large square, that's fine. So you might divide 300 by 2.5 or 3.2. It doesn't matter. You can still use part of a large square. Now, if the heart rate is irregular, and commonly this would be atrial fibrillation, it's a little bit harder. This is because the heart rate varies over time, from minute to minute, for example. Again, various ways of doing this. Some people count the number of large squares between one R wave and the next, where the R waves are very close together, the closest they are, and then do the same where the R waves are the furthest apart and therefore they have a range. They might say the heart rate is ranging from 60 to 100 beats per minute. Alternatively, you could count 30 large squares. This equates to six seconds in time. Count the number of R waves in that 30 large square period and times by 10 to get up to a minute. And that will give you the heart rate in a minute. And it's, it's, it's not the most brilliant way of doing it, but it does pick up the irregularity in heart rate. Now, if you have to ascertain whether the heart rate is regular or irregular, feel the pulse. But sometimes when the heart rate is particularly high, and in untreated atrial fibrillation this may be the case, it's difficult to ascertain whether it is regular or irregular. In that case, lay a piece of paper over the 12 lead ECG and mark off two to three R waves. Move the piece of paper along. If irregular, subsequent R waves won't fit over those marks on the paper. If regular, they will. Step six, scanning the leads. You need to look at the limb leads and the chest leads for a variety of abnormalities. As you gain more experience, you can add to your armory of the things you're gonna look for. But as a suggestion, you could look for ST elevation, which could indicate myocardial infarction. Do remember that an MI, a myocardial infarction, can be there in the absence of ST elevation, but it's something to look for. ST depression or T wave inversion, which could indicate ischemia. Tall R waves, particularly over the left ventricle, could indicate left ventricular hypertrophy. Ventricular ectopics or extrasystole, a whole range of things you can look for. 
Importantly, what you're able to see on the 12 lead when you scan the leads is dictated by the underlying arrhythmia. Let me give you an example. In ventricular tachycardia, or VT, by nature the QRS complex is a wide and bizarre shape, so you're really not going to be able to see ST elevation or ST depression. Whereas in atrial fibrillation, or AF, as a generalisation, and this includes other atrial arrhythmias, the QRS complex is normal in shape, so you will be able to see those abnormalities. So you need to consider what the underlying arrhythmia is, and this will all come with experience. In addition, you need to be able to understand and recognise how each of the leads differ normally on the 12 lead ECG or EKG. This comes with practice and it's really beyond the scope of this clip to be able to go through each lead. But I invite you to join me at fastlearnecg.com and I'll go through that with you. It's basically about the relationship between where the lead is looking at the heart and where the electrical impulse or depolarization is passing. So, for example, in lead 2, the electrical impulse or depolarization is heading towards that lead and gives a very upright lead. You get a tall R wave and a much more shallow S wave. Whereas in lead AVR, the electrical impulse or depolarization is heading away from that lead, so you get a very downward QRS complex, a short R wave and a much deeper S wave. Whereas lead AVL, the impulse is heading neither towards that lead nor away from it. It's heading by it at right angles. And so generally, although there are variations, the R wave is as tall as the S wave is deep. Now that may be so, but obviously in the heat of clinical practice, you're going to say, well, you know, how am I going to remember what all the 12 leads look like? There are tips to do this, which I'll go through with you at fastlearnecg.com. There's a quick drawing which takes about 30 seconds. You can flip over your paper, your 12 lead ECG EKG, and draw it, and that will quickly remind you what the limb leads look like. And I can do that with you on that website. The chest leads are much easier to remember. They progress from negative to positive in health. That is, they start with a short R wave and a deep S wave and end up with a much taller R wave and a shallow S wave. Again, this is because V1 or C1 senses electrical activity heading much more towards the left ventricle and gives you a very negative QRS complex, whereas Lees V5 or V6 sense electrical activity coming towards them and give a taller R wave and a shallower S wave. So that's it. That's my six steps to reviewing or reading a 12 lead ECG or EKG. It's been an absolute pleasure being with you and I'd love to work with you some more to increase your knowledge, your confidence and your competence and we can do that together at fastlearnecg.com. We charge a small nominal fee to cover the cost of running the website, but that's convertible to your currency wherever you are in the world. The important thing is that more healthcare professionals increase their knowledge and skill in this area so that we can all give first-rate patient care in relation to reading the 12-lead ECG or EKG. Take care, and I look forward to joining you again soon.